Jeremiah 32. Yeah, so 31 through uh, through 34, I believe, or 33, he's, he's speaking about the return of Israel to their land, and then ultimately a return to the, uh, God's home in the millennium age after the tribulation period. Um, one thing that I've learned as a Christian, I was going to say mature Christian, but I'm still maturing, <laughs> is that God is faithful to his promises. I find I'm not faithful in keeping my promises, but he's faithful in keeping his promises. Now, I also understand that there are times when I feel like I feel like he hasn't kept his promise, and I think we all have felt that. Like, you promised me this, and yet it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and we need to understand, and I think we know this, but it's, it's aligning our feelings with, with truth, is that God's timing is not our timing. And he has reasons for allowing certain things to take place before he does give us uh, the fulfillment of those promises that he's given unto us. Now, obviously, there are promises in the scriptures that are, that are very clear, uh, like salvation, if you confess your uh, sins before the Lord and that he is Lord and that he resurrected from the dead, as Romans says, then you will be saved. That's a promise he's given to us and we are assured of that promise. And so we know that we have a place in, in heaven. And John 5.13 says that, that if you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, then you have that assurance uh, that you have eternal life. And he writes that for that reason, so that you know. So that's a promise that, that we find in scriptures, a promise of the Holy Spirit that has come upon us and dwells within us and lives in us and guides us and leads us and empowers, empowers us also. These are all truthful promises. But then there are those promises that he gives to us as individuals, right? Those promises where we're just walking in life and trying to serve Him the best we can and, and things seem to happen and, and we have desires, we have hungers, we have wants and needs and, and we're just praying and seeking God and, and we sense that God is promising us something. And sometimes those promises, we're, we're really not sure if it's us or if it's God really promising those things to us. And, and that's the dilemma we have sometimes, right, with our nature. Is that you, God, or is it me? Are you promising me that or are you not promising me that? And I think in those times, we really need to fall back on what we do know. And that is that when Jesus prayed in the garden, he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I would love this to be a promise. I have a hard time even expressing to others that God promised me something because I don't know if he did or not. It just might be me. And I don't want to be presumptuous when God never did promise me those things. Now, there's promises that we've had for this church, uh, for the ministry, for my personal life and my wife's life concerning the ministry and what God was going to do. And he hasn't fulfilled those things yet. And it's been 20 years in ministry. I just read a post in Facebook, and, and it was really encouraging because it, it listed uh, the years that certain people had to wait before God finally you know, fulfill the promises. I think Moses was like uh, 80 years, 40 in Egypt and 40 in the wilderness, and then finally, so 80 years. So I've got a ways to go. I got 60 years to go before that promise. Of course, I'll be gone and dead. Now, Jeremiah is an interesting guy because he's promised something here in this chapter, and he ain't going to see it. He doesn't even get to see the promise fulfilled. You can believe God on his promises and that he will fulfill them. But they will be on his timing, not your timing. <clears throat> we get upset because we get a little arrogant, right? Like, well, I deserve <laughs> to see that. Really? <laughs> we don't deserve anything. And we have to remember that. If we experience something great, the revival of the hippie movement and what God was doing, I would have loved to have been there at that time. I got the tail end of it and experienced a revival in my own life, but it was a tail end. That would have been a neat time to, to just see the Holy Spirit moving in such a powerful way. Um, but you don't all get to see those promises that, that God has given to us. God gave us a promise for this building here, and he's fulfilled that promise to us. And we acted on that promise. And that's 
important to understand that when God does give us a promise, we act on it. So the promise of, uh, of salvation, you act on it, right? So you believe it and you live it. And so you're acting on it, and, and a, then you'll see the fruitation of it when you get to heaven. The, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he indwells you, so you allow him to lead and guide you. You act on it. And we'll see that here in, with Jeremiah. God's going to ask him to purchase a piece of land, and he has to act on it, though he's not going to see that promise. There's three things that are happening in this chapter. Uh, one, as I mentioned, Jeremiah is going to purchase a piece of land as a sign of God's promise that he would keep. And then Jeremiah will be persecuted again, again, and again. Poor guy. I, you know, I, I really admire this guy. There are two people, I think, in scriptures that, that I can kind of relate to. One is Peter, because I always seem to put my foot in my mouth, say things before I think. And my wife reminds me of that a lot. And, and I know that. And how do you change something like that about you? It's real difficult to do. You've got to wait for the Lord to do that. And, and maybe you're not dealing with that specific thing, but you're dealing with something that you just can't change. And you have to wait for the Lord to do that. And I feel like Peter was like that, and I'm like that. And then Jeremiah, the poor guy, has been so faithful to the Lord, has prayed and sought the Lord and worked for the Lord and served the Lord and the people, put himself in situations that were very harmful for himself and so forth, and yet not seen one convert, not seen one promise, not seen any of that at all, and yet so faithful to it all. And I can kind of relate to that maybe to a certain degree, because I've seen some fruit. I, I've seen people saved. I, I've seen God's hand working uh, more than, uh, than Jeremiah probably did. But I can relate with him and, and the struggles that he has probably had. The other thing is that the prayer of Jeremiah will be answered by God. So we see the future restoration of Jerusalem in chapters, as I said, actually 30 through 33. It goes back one chapter further. In this chapter here is a rebuilding of Jerusalem. Let's look at uh, Israel's circumstance here in verses 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. So in the 10th year of the Judah king and the 18th year of the king of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar had been on the throne a little longer than that of Zedekiah. The date is probably about 587 BC. There was a city that was under siege. In other words, the the enemy had come around Jerusalem and they sieged it. They they boarded up everything and they basically lived in the city while the enemy was outside of the city waiting for them to come out and fight this battle. And it lasted several months. And we can find that account in Second Kings 25 if you want to read the context of this this chapter here. We just don't have the time to do that. But you're more than welcome to go back and, and read that um, it, Second Kings is a, just an interesting book, along with First uh, Kings and then First Samuel and uh, and oh, I'm sorry, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. Also, those four books all go together, and they have different perspectives. Um, now, it records the fall uh, and the captivity here of Judah. I'll read a little bit of it. It came to pass in in twenty five one, uh, in the ninth year of his reign, and in the tenth month. On the tenth day of the month that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So that's the context here. For then, verse 2, back to <clears throat> Jeremiah. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up, and the court of the prison, which was in the king's, uh, king of Judah's house. Now, Jeremiah had recorded that King Zedekiah, when he first became king, had asked Jeremiah to pray for him. He, he needed God's wisdom and direction. And so, as a prophet of God, he called on him. And of course, as a prophet, a true prophet of God, uh, he would only pray and only give what God gave to him to, to the king. He wouldn't do anything more, uh, less than that. 
And that got him in trouble because the king didn't like what he had to say. Uh, he was told that is Zedekiah that Egypt would no longer have power over Israel, but that Babylon would then capture them and burn the city down. Jeremiah confirmed this by being the word of the Lord even after Zedekiah had put him into the dungeon. He didn't like that. It wasn't a good prophecy. Yeah, Egypt has, has been taken care of, but now Babylon and will be burnt down. That, that's not good news. Jeremiah, I don't like that news. And so he ended up uh, being put into prison there in um, the house of the secretary of Zedekiah under guard, eating a loaf of bread and and kind of uh, threatened that uh, you'll eat a loaf of bread as long as there's bread in the city. So if your prophecy comes true, then you're going to die, basically what what he was saying there. And it wasn't until later on that some of the officials uh, came in to... Uh, help out uh, Jeremiah. So so you see his situation and what's going on there at this time. And then in verse 3, Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up saying, why do you prophesy and say, thus says the Lord? That, that, that's like, why do you as a preacher preach that word like that and you offend people? Yeah, you know, well, because it's the word, and I can't do anything other than that. You know, and Jeremiah's like, "Well, that's what God gave me, and I have to tell you what the truth is." And so, why do you get so mad at me? Why won't you just accept the truth? You know, that's really my struggle: is why don't you just accept the truth? Uh, that's difficult uh, for so many uh, to accept the truth because they're so indoctrinated by this world and the culture and the things that surround us our our lives and our upbringing and things and it's it's so hard to get rid of all of that and say okay lord how do i how do i live according to your word how do i take your information and how do i apply it to my life now so that my life can change because it has to be changing constantly changing even if you're older, it has to be changing. You have to be growing from glory to glory, the Bible says. That means you're growing and growing every year. There's that continual filling of the Holy Spirit with knowledge and wisdom and understanding of God where you get more intimate and deep with Him because of that understanding and that growth. And the less you get with the world, the less you get with its knowledge and philosophies. Uh, Paul talks about that, to get rid of those vain philosophies uh, of this world. So, uh, why do you prophesy and say that? Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah king of Judah shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, but shall surely be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. So that was the prophecy that Jeremiah gave to Zedekiah, which put him into prison, basically. Look at verse 6 as Jeremiah's commitment to God, to God's promise. Uh, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shulam, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is in Enoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Now, Jeremiah's cousin is mentioned only in this passage here. Um, Shemiel, the uncle, who was the father of Jeremiah's cousin, came to him and he was to purchase a piece of land according to the law of redemption. And you find this law of redemption in Leviticus chapter 25, and you can read that on your own, but let me just give you verse 20. If one of your brethren, and and that's important, it had to be a relative. If you own land and you were going through hard times and you had to give up that land. You would usually lease it. We call it leasing today. Back then it was you would sell it, but it really wasn't out of your reach. 
Uh, there was an opportunity to redeem that land. There was, there was a clause in that deed, and you had to give them the deed. And in that deed, there's a clause that you had the right to redeem that land. If at any point you had the money or a relative that can come by and help, you could go and, and pay the debt, and that land came back uh, to your family. Or there was also another law that, that talked about the, the seventh year. So at the seventh year, then, it was the year of redeem, redemption. You could go and get back that land free of charge. So that was the law of redemption. Mister talks a little bit about uh, that law as I was listening to him today. When you could redeem uh, that land free of charge and it came back into the family so that the tribes could keep their own land. Then there was also the year of jubilee when all debts were completely paid off. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> I wish we had that. You know, there's some that think that that's not a good idea. Uh, that um, it would cause chaos you know, in the world because debts were completely paid off. I, I think the United States would be very happy to get their $18 trillion debt paid off and, and rising really rapidly. Right here in 32, Jeremiah would purchase this land and the reason for purchasing this land was to signify to the people and to Jeremiah himself that God keeps his promise. See, by the land, and in 70 years, by the way, which is seven tens, in 70 years, when you come back, you have the land. And so, he's saying you can bank on that promise. If you buy that land, I will bring you back to that land. Now, Jeremiah won't see that. <clears throat> it will be his family that sees it. The same is true of, of, of Israel also, that they would go back to the land in the 70th year and return. Jesus, in Revelation chapter 5, we see the picture of him redeeming the world. <coughs> the world was his, he created it. And he created it and he gave it to who? To us, right? Uh, we were to dwell in the land. We were to... Fill the land with offspring, with children, uh, l girls and boys, and just, just populate it. We were to till the ground. We were to take care of the garden. It was ours. Satan comes along, deceives a woman, <clears throat> and they forfeit it over to him. So he now becomes the, the God of the world system. And so when we saw Sunday that he offered these things to, to Jesus, they were his to offer. You know, they were his, and Jesus realized that. I don't want your things, though. You know, I have something better than that. I have the plan and the purpose of God. And so Jesus will come along in Revelation chapter 5, and you remember him, one foot in, in, in the ocean and one in the, on the earth and so forth, and he's got the deeds in his hands. Who can redeem that? Who is worthy to redeem it? Well, it's Jesus Christ who's worthy to redeem the land because he's God in the flesh. And so he redeems the world for us. There's a man called Jonathan Cain, Ken, C A H N. I'm probably saying that wrong. He's Jew, he's a Jewish he's a Jewish rabbi pastor, so he's a Christian, and he's got some interesting views on seven year cycles. Now, I have one major problem with with his views, <clears throat> and that is is that he's trying to apply uh, the Shema, Shema, she. Sheathmoth. It's hard to pronounce these words. It's the law of the Sheathmoth, which is the law of the Sabbath. So seven days you rest. You know, uh, in seven years you redeem the land. The year of Jubilee is seven uh, fifties. So everything. So he talks about the number seven and how how important that number is for the children of Israel. But he tries to apply it to us today, America. And, and he's in doing that. He says that we're headed for some disaster. I think just looking at America, I think you realize you're headed for a disaster, $18 trillion. But he does come up with a couple of uh, years where we had the last crash and then the, the one previous to that, a major event, and it was seven years exactly. And he's saying this coming year, September 29th, would be the Shema in the Jewish calendar, and thus there's going to be something major taking place in the stock market here. He goes, it may totally crash uh, completely. 
which I find interesting. It may, and it may not. And he's, he's just warning people, trying to get them to, to um, pull their money out and put it somewhere else just for safety reasons and so forth. Um, but again, the major problem I have is, is that he's applying uh, these principles of the Old Testament that no longer apply because they're of the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled the, the, the seventh day of rest. And so he's the fulfillment of it all now. But I think America is still headed for some, some bad areas. We're now, what, I think we're now second, right? Of the wealthiest. China's the first, which is, it's been unheard of since we, you know, became a, a nation. We've always been on top. And so we owe them a lot of money. And I guess the interest is going to be due here soon also. So some things are going to happen. Are we going to see it? Possibly. Is that God's judgment? I don't know. I don't know if that's God's judgment. It's our stupidity. But it's not, it could be the beginning of God's judgment. It could be the crippling of the United States. And it fits right into prophecy because the United States is not in prophecy uh, we hear in Ezekiel thirty-eight, thirty-nine that there are nations who kind of stand by and watch what's going on because maybe they don't have any strength or power to help out. Or maybe they just don't want to because there's a president that doesn't care about Israel. And so let's, you know, forget them. We've got our own problems. We're, we're trying to build a, a nation on socialism now. So, and the church has kind of caught that a little bit. There was a... a CEO, a Christian CEO of a company who just, um, I can't remember his name and what company it was, but he just took his 700000 a year and, and he cut it down to 70000 And he took the rest and he gave, him, gave it to all his employees and says, the minimum that you'll make is $70,000. we will all make $70,000 a year. Like, wow, that's pretty good. But that's in line with socialism, right? And everyone gets to the part of the pot and so forth. Not that that's bad. I mean, you see it in the book of Acts. Chapter 2, everyone comes together and they start giving and distributing. It's not what God wanted. He wanted them to scatter and spread the gospel. He doesn't want us to gather. You know, but ultimately, God's going to have the perfect social system <laughs> where he provides for everybody equally and fairly. But that will be righteously under his government and his economy. And he's perfect in every way. We just can't do that. It's difficult for us to do. So interesting, interesting stuff in times that we're living in. We definitely are just not not just looking at the financial struggle that we're in these United States, but the churches themselves, the struggles that churches are having, uh, the battles there. Sunday, I'm going to share a little bit what I shared last week uh, with uh, Germany and how God used that to bring Israel back to Israel the people, to Israel the land. They were so persecuted, many were killed. Anti-Semitism was rising, and so they needed a place to go. And so God used that whole Holocaust thing to force them back into the land, thus fulfilling his prophecy. And I'm going to just share some things that I think are important that we see happening uh, today. Uh, I guess there was some more beheadings uh, here recently with, with Isa. This guy, Jonathan, thinks that, that Isa is, again, a type of Syria. Back when you go to the Old Testament and you see the Babylonians, that the Syrians actually came in there and they were attacking Israel for a while. They were known as the first terrorists. And so he's taking that and saying, see how it happened with Israel? It's happening with the United States. So now the terrorists are coming here. And he says, we're going to probably see that a little bit here, but they won't be successful uh, we'll be able to you know, take care of that. But again, it's just the, the picture is there. They'll come in, it'll cause chaos. People will be aware of it. Of course, we saw the 9-11, which happened on Ashima, a, a cycle of Ashima, September 11. He also suggests, and I don't know how much of this is true, so don't, don't go saying this is true, but, but he said that the, um, what was it, the area uh, where the 9-11, the, the Twin Towers were, were exactly where I believe the uh, Jewish people were when they were being attacked by terrorists. If you go look at the geographical area. So I don't know how that all fits in. But interesting stuff. I, mean, I just think that we're living in, in some interesting days. And <clears throat> here's, the, here's my, my thing. Is that we need to be ready. And he's saying be ready financially you know, for the collapse. I'm saying be ready spiritually. 
be right with the Lord. Walk with the Lord. Get busy and start sending your rewards to heaven. You know, prepare your kids. Get them into the Word of God. Get them to understand there's more to life than food and clothing and all those things. The gospel has to be spread. People have to be saved. Love has to go out, and we have to be concerned for people. Uh, falling away, people are falling away like crazy. Uh, they're not believing in Christianity anymore. There's too much uh, chaos in Christianity, too many um, lukewarm churches that aren't standing on a solid foundation that have no... Uh, substance at all but they're just believing what the culture believes and we're all seeing those things uh, unfolding even now as Thessalonians says it would so <clears throat> he spied this land and it says and Hanamiel my uncle's son came to me verse 8 in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said to me please buy my field uh, that is in Enoth. Now that's Jeremiah's hometown and him being the relative he had the right to do that which is in the country of Benjamin which is north of Jerusalem there. For the right of inheritance is yours and the redemption yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I know that this was the word of the Lord. So I bought the field from Hanel, the son of my uncle who was in Anath, and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver. And they weren't coins, they were, they were more like ounces of, of silver of grams um, so for they didn't have coins at that time so he measured it out and then gave it to him uh, they have found by the way just a, a little side note they, they have found like 250 grams of silver there in Nebuchadnezzar in that area um, as evidence that that's how they used to uh, take care of their the transactions and so forth they call them hordes and I signed the deed and sealed it took witnesses and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the purchase deed to Brath, the son of Nirth, the son of Mishith, in the presence of Hanmiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the purchase deed before all the Jews who sat in the court of the prison. Uh, Breath was his scribe. Uh, he was a close companion of Jeremiah, so uh, he gave the, the deed to them and made it all legal. And I charged Breath before them, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this purchase deed which is sealed and the deeds which is open, and put them in the earthen vessel, that they may last many days. So bury it, stick it down there, and when you come back, they'll know where it's at, unbury it, you have the deed, you present it, and it's your land. And God promised it, and it will happen. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Uh, isn't that hard to believe? It would be hard to believe when you're living there, and he's telling you that Babylon's going to come and take you away for 70 years, but then you'll come back. That's a hard thing to believe. I think it's hard for us to believe that you just look at our country and you hear people talking about ISA and beheadings, but yet people just don't believe it. They don't believe they're going to come in here. They're already coming in through Mexico and El Paso there. The cartel's bringing them in, smuggling them in here and there. Um, they're already in. But yet there's this numbness to it, right? We're, we're kind of, uh, I don't know what it is. We just, just kind of like the 9-11. You remember when the 9-11 happened? I remember the day that it happened and I was in the gym and, and we looked on the TV and everybody was going, what's going on? So we all kind of gathered around. Everybody stopped working out. And, and we're just watching this thing, not knowing w what was going on, not knowing that it was a terrorist act. We just thought planes were hitting the building, and we're all just standing there. But you, I don't know if you were around at that time or if you were Christians, but the churches just immediately got packed. Uh, the church that I was going to just packed out completely. And it lasted for three weeks and then boom, everybody went back to doing what they did. It wasn't very lasting. And that's just the, the mentality. We see this stuff. I, last week I, I shared a little bit about the ISIS beheadings and I wanted to see a beheading. And I just saw some more. These were worse than what I saw. And um, <clears throat> when I saw it, I was more amazed at the chanting and the demonic presence uh, of these men that were, were, were hacking away at this guy's head. But you know what was sad is that I was 
numb. It didn't bother me to see the hacking. Why is that? And I said, Lord, help me. What is wrong with me? That means my heart has been hardened to that type of scene. And I think the movie industry has done that. The things that we read, what we see on TV and the news and so forth, and it's kind of desensitized us to that type of stuff. So now we look at it like, oh yeah, wow. And that's it. It doesn't move us to go, whoa, we better get ready. We better do something. We better get involved. We better call someone. You know, we better get the guards out here. You know, it doesn't move us that way anymore. We're going to wait till it's on our porch and we're going to go, what happened? Where were you? Why aren't you helping us? And then it's too late. And then you got guns all over the place. People running down the street shooting at each other because they don't know who's who. I mean, you can see that stuff happening. Interesting. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, you'll possess the land again. So you can believe God's promises. You can believe them completely. Um, When Jesus came down from the mountain with uh, Peter and John, they met a father who was crying out in tears about the Lord, about uh, to the Lord about his son who was demon possessed, and, and the disciples couldn't do anything. And he asked, Lord. Help me, help me. And the Lord said, if you believe. And the man said, help my unbelief. And that's an attitude to have. Lord, I know you have promises. Help me to believe your promises. Because there are times when I don't believe them. I don't believe you'll work through this situation. I don't believe you'll help us in this area. Those are the times where you just ask the Lord, Lord, I need your help to believe. Help my unbelief, Lord. Because I know you're able to. You created the heavens and the earth. There's nothing that you can't do. So if I have unbelief, then help my unbelief. Help me to believe that you will answer my prayer. And God is like that. He wants us to believe and trust in Him. Without faith, you're unable to please God, Hebrews tells us. He tells us in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, whatever you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them. And you'll have them. Now, I believe it's inferred in these scriptures that when you, whatever you ask, it's implied that you're going to ask what is biblically correct, right? You're going to ask for sinful things. You're going to ask for the desires of God. Lord, meet the needs of my family. I think that's biblical. Paul says, if you don't work, you don't eat. So you're working. You're providing. God will meet those needs. He promises to do so. Guide us, Lord, as we're going through a wilderness. He promises to guide us, and we can believe him at that. Lord, give us the Holy Spirit that we may have wisdom and discernment in what's going on around us, Lord. And he promises to give us the Holy Spirit. If He gives us, if we give our sons good things, how much more will he give us? How much more? So we can believe him at his word. He'll get us through this time, right? Through this time of ISA, through this time of the collapse of our financial difficulty. Won't he? I think he will. Will it be different? Of course it will. Will people die? Probably. Will we die? Hey, praise the Lord, we're in heaven. It's over. Boy, that's definitely a good thing. But he'll get us through. Just like he got the children of Israel through the wilderness. Brought down quail from heaven. Manna. Water through a rock. I mean, he can do anything. And so we can believe that if we're going to go through some hardship, if we're going to go through hardship when God collapses the United States, that he's going to provide for us. It may mean that we might have to band together a little bit. It may mean we might have to store up some food, some water. And things like that. And I think we should be thinking about those things. I know I am. I know Virginia was twisting my arm the other day about it. And so God will get us through. I believe that completely because he's our God and we're his children and he's going to watch over us. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy though. I think of Corey Timboon and how the Lord got her through. A lot of others died though, but she got through. God had a plan for her life. And she's been a a testimony of that. 
Listen to Jeremiah's prayer. I love prayers in the Bible. Jesus gave us that outline of a prayer, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer. And you see some of Paul's prayers, for, especially for the believers, you know, uh, his prayer and his acknowledgement of remembering them always in hopes that they would be united and love one another. And that was always his emphasis in, in, in correcting the church and <laughs> correcting, uh, you know, the, the believers of, of those times. It always started with, this is my heart, is that I love you guys. And I want to see you in unity. I want to see you in love. I want to see the grace and the work of God working. Uh, get rid of that arrogance. Get rid of the pride and just get busy together. And, and then he would go on and correct you. In Ephesians, the whole f- first chapter is all about what God's done for us. And then he gets into what we need to get, be doing. You know, and God has done a lot for us. And here, it's interesting how he starts off his prayer. Now, when I had delivered the purchase deed to Bereth, the son of Nerech, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, you made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. I love that. It's like Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. I mean, just boom, right there in the throne. Let's, let's start with you first, God. Let's talk about you and how great you are. Let's ha- talk about how you created the heavens and the earth. I, I love thinking about that. I, I love imagining God in heavens and just going, okay, earth. I mean, did he go? Or did he just go? You know, I don't know how, but he just. And everything just started falling into place. Was he sitting back in his recliner just watching? You know, everything, were, you know, everything was just you know, completely in place. You're like, wow, how did you do that? I want to see that instant replay when I get to heaven. That's pretty powerful. And then to, to create man and then the animals and the fit and just everything together. He, he did it all. If he did, it, did all of that, then why can't he help us? He can. And so start your prayers off recognizing who God is. Recognizing what he's done. Recognizing what he's going to do because he's God. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. You are great in counsel and mighty in work. For your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his way and according to the fruit of his doing. You're a fair God. You're a fair God. And you see all men. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Again, so now going back to the Egypt, the deliverance. Uh, it's good to go back to scriptural stories and say, well, God, if you delivered them, why can't you deliver me? If you gave them manna, you can take care of our needs. If you provided for them while they were in this wilderness and protected them against the elements, you can do the same for me, Lord. Just like in Egypt. To this day, and in Israel, and among other men, and you have made yourself a name as it is this day. You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, and with great terror. I think of uh, Rahab, uh, when the spies went up and they said, oh, we heard of you, because they heard of what God had done. You have given them this land of which you swore to your fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and took possession of it, but they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law. They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity to come upon them. And that's where you start getting real in the meat of it, right? Okay, so we recognize who God is. Now, here's, here's the situation, God. This is our problem. Now, let's focus on us. And that's not much to focus on. Now, how unfaithful we are. Here, you blessed us. And here, I'm so unfaithful. I like what John the Baptist said. It just keeps resonating in my mind. And I remember listening to myself years ago, more and more about John when, when he kind of prepared the way for the Lord. And at the end of his life, uh, before being beheaded, he realized that I must you know, decrease and he must increase. He realized that he needed to be out of the picture. 
and that he need to, needed to leave so that Christ's popularity and, uh, would grow and his plan and the work of God would be fulfilled through him and not through, through John, that he wouldn't be a distraction, that he wouldn't be a focus for any man because he'd be completely out of the picture. And, and that's what we should be doing. We should learn to decrease and be out of the picture and just let God do what he needs to do. And, and I find I can't do that. There's too much pride. There's too much that I want to do. I want people to love me. And people to like me. I even struggle with that at the church. How many stories do I t- tell about me? I went to a meeting yesterday and we were talking about this strange fire that John MacArthur uh, slammed on Calvary Chapel and, and other Pentecostal groups uh, calling it strange fire of the Holy Spirit. So the topic was about the strange fire. Is the gifts of the Spirit still in operation today? You know, so there's a big argument over that whole thing. <clears throat> and so in the conversation, I just kind of raised... I'm, I'm that guy that kind of has to force myself to raise my hand. And I did, and I, and I says, you know, one of the... One of the evidence besides the word, besides the the the, for, the fathers, the reformers and stuff who, who wrote some of this stuff uh, that believed the Calvinists, Calvin who didn't believe in the gifts and then some of the other guys that, that did believe in the gifts and they brought all that stuff. So there's also one more truth and that, that's the Holy, Holy Spirit you know, who makes these things true and I kind of shared my testimony how I came to the Lord and how being a Catholic and not ever stepping a foot into a Christian church. And yet God came into my life and I read the Bible and I started hearing these messages and I started agreeing with them because I read them and he was confirming what I believed. I mean, we were, we were hanging around Mormons right before I got converted. I could have easily gone into Mormonism. Uh, I was listening to the radio and I was listening to the faith and wealth doctrine. Uh, I was listening to real extreme Pentecostal Preachers, I mean, I'm talking screaming and yelling type. And then I was listening to the Baptist too. Very conservative, you know. And then Methodist. And, you know, I was listening to all these. I could have gone in all these different directions. But something about Calvary Chapel that just turned me on. And it was simply this. They just read the Bible. It was like, that's what I want. I just want to know what God has to say. Yeah, you're, you're a good speaker. Yeah, you, you know, you, you're fluent. You, you use great words. Your adjectives are wonderful. And, you know, but what, you, what is the word saying? What is it saying? Tell me what it's saying because I want to know that more than anything else. And I love that. And, and you would hear the raw Reese's to the John Corsons, you know, and you go, wow, it's the same word. And, and they all got it. And, and that's what I loved about it. And it was a moving of the Holy Spirit. And so then... When I came to the gifts of the Spirit, and you would hear like the Dave Hawkins at that time, Dave Hawkins didn't believe the gifts were in, in, in operation. He does today. <laughs> he does today because of the situations, but <laughs> it's another story. Um, I listened to Dave Hawkins. I'm like, something's not right there. I, I don't, I, I felt the Spirit. I, I, I've seen the gifts moving in my own life. I wanted to take a, a little poll real quick with all these pastors. There are probably about uh, 20, 20 pastors. And uh, Justin, who's this Greek scholar, was teaching. And I wanted to say, how many of you all speak in tongues? I just kind of wanted to see, you know. I said, well, we'll pray for you so you have the evidence of your salvation. <laughs> now, some of you don't know what that means. <laughs> That's a Pentecostal thing. <laughs> so, and I was riding home with Rawl, and Rawl says, pray for me. I don't speak in tongues. Like that's fine. That's okay. I mean, you're still saved. <laughs> you know. But and then you know, I wanted to tell him, okay, well, this is how I did it. But you can't do that, can you? Because that's not how it's done. It has to be a, a, a move of the spirit. You have to catch it. You can't make it happen. Uh, when I wanted to speak in tongues, I remember I, I just had such a desire for it. And so I went to this one guy who spoke in tongues. He goes, "Come on, I'll show you how to do it." Like, you'll show me how to do it. Okay. So he sat me in a chair and he tells me, okay, repeat after me, chandelier, chandelier, chandelier. And I look at him like, what? He goes, yeah, yeah, say it fast, say it fast. I'm like, no, this is not how you speak in tongues. You know, saying chandelier. Come on, you're forcing that. No, that doesn't happen like that. It, it, It happens by you catching it. 
It's like someone walking around trying to catch a cold. You got a cold? Come over here. I want to catch a cold. You know, you're trying to catch something. You're trying to force something. No, you'll get it, and you'll get it good when it just comes to you. And you won't even be seeking it. You won't even be desiring it. You're going to try to stay away from it, and it just comes to you. That's what happened to me. I was just on my way to a, a, a class at David Rosales' church on counseling, how to counsel biblically. And on the way, I was just praising God. I was just singing to Him. I was driving along. I raised my hand. I'm just singing. All of a sudden, these words just came out. And I'm like, oh, what was that? And I stopped for a second singing. And all of a sudden, I started singing again. And more words just came out. And I was in total control of it. And so I went to the class, parked outside there. And for 45 minutes, I was just speaking in tongues. I was was just so blown away by it. And I missed class completely because people were coming out. Uh, I've experienced it. And so I know that it's, it's, it's real. It's something you catch. And that's something that the Holy Spirit does. You, you, you get back to what is the issue in your prayer. Okay, God, this is who you are, but these are the issues. These are the struggles. And we have those struggles here in the church. And they came, verse 23, and they came in and took possession of it, that they have not obeyed your voice or walked in your law, They have done nothing of all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have caused all this calamity upon them. Look, the the siege mounts. They have come to the city to take it, and the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans who fight against it because because of swords and famine and pestilence. What you have spoken has happened. There you see it. And you have said to me, O Lord God, buy the field for money, and take witness, yet the city has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. So he didn't believe it. And this is my prayer. Help my unbelief. I don't see this happening. So Jeremiah struggled with this buying of the land. So the word, the Lord confirms it. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there nothing too hard for me? Minded of Job. When Job began to question the Lord and the Lord said, hey, Job, were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? You weren't there, yet I created them. Is there anything too hard for me to do? No, God, you're God. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hands of the Chaldeans, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against the city shall come and set fire to the city and burn it with the houses on whose roofs they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Now again, you know this, that you, those roofs back then were flat, and so they were able to get on top and, and kind of enjoy the stars and the sun. Well, on top of there, they had their little idols, and they were offering up um, sacrifices to those idols there. And God says, I see it all. And that's why you're being taken over. Because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. Have you provoked the Lord? Think about your life. I'll let you take that back. For this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger. They, their kings, their prince, their priests, the prophets, uh, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they were all corrupt, all idolaters. And they have turned to me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rise up early and teach them, yet they have not listened to receive instruction. Hmm. But they set their abomination in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. Ezekiel talks about that. Remember when we went through Ezekiel and how they defiled the temple itself? Ezekiel went into the temple and he actually saw idols in the temple. And God then told him to go look in, there was a hole in the wall, to look in the hole in the wall. As he looked in the hole in the wall, in the Holy of Holies, there were were idols there uh, that they were sacrificing, the priest uh, offerings and so forth. So even within the temples itself, they were defiled. 
And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the, of the sons of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come to my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And Molech was a Canaanite deity that they would actually take their, their children and, and put, put them on the arms of, of this heated idol as an offering, as a sacrifice uh, to that idol. It was their way of abortion. In, in a sense, we see him in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, where he talks about uh, the fire of Molech there and how they profaned the Lord their God. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the city of which you say, it shall be delivered into the hands of the kings of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath, and I will bring them back to the place and I will cease cause them to dwell safely and they shall be my people and I will be their God then I will give them one heart one way that they may fear me forever for the Lord or for the good of them and their children after them <clears throat> and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good but i will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me yes i will rejoice over them to do good or to do them good and i will surely plant them in the land with all my heart and with all my soul for thus says the lord just as i brought all this great calamity on this people so i will bring them all the good that i have promised them the fields will be brought into this land of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It has been given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will, bury, men will buy fields for money, signs, deeds, seal them and take witness in the land of Benjamin, in the place around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the mountains, in the cities of the lowland, and in the cities of the south, for I will cause their captives to return, thus says the Lord. So you can depend on his promises. Purchase the land. You'll come back. <clears throat> when God makes a promise, uh, you can believe it, that he'll keep it. In fact, you can purchase uh, a land, you can invest, you can start a family, you can trust in me. For us today, it, it, we realize Romans eight twenty eight, right? That, that all things work together for good for those who are uh, called according to his purposes for whom he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we know all things work together for good for us. Paul said this in Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness, and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. The Spirit of unity. God's going to reunite them and they're going to have one heart and one mind. Paul says he's called us today, the Gentiles, to unity, to one spirit, to one mind. Something to pray about in our lives. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the book of Jeremiah and the life of Jeremiah and the words that you have given to him and the prophecies, Lord, were amazing as we see Israel a nation today, Lord and the struggles that uh, they are going through. Father, at this moment, Lord, we pray for them, we love them, we support them, Lord, as much as we can as a little church, Lord. Uh, I wish we could do even more, Lord. Would you increase, Father, our resources uh, that we may uh, give uh, to your people, Israel, even more, Lord. I think of Jacob, who, who was basically 
letting you know, Lord, before the law was even there, he was basically saying, Lord, look, you meet my needs, you provide for my family, I will take a tenth of that and I will give it back to you. And that's what I'm saying here this evening, Lord, that you would meet our needs here, that you take care of what we, we need to provide for this family, Lord. And Lord, it would be enough for to also provide for your family, Israel, Lord, there in their land, that the gospel may go out uh, to your precious people, Lord, whom we love deeply, Lord. We look forward to the restoration of them <clears throat> as we will be in heaven during this whole tribulation period, Father, but we'll be reunited and we will become one body together as we worship you in this perfect uh, place, heaven, and in the new Jerusalem, Lord. We thank you for the promises that you've given to us, Lord. May you fulfill them, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.